Gabriella, how are you? I'm doing so well, Greta. How are you? I'm doing well. I'm so happy that you came to see us today and to talk to our audience. We're going to have a great show today. Um, but first, I would like to start out. Tell us who you are, the organization you're with, and what do you all do? Sure. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. I'm really excited. Like you said, I'm Gabriella. I work at an organization called Texas Jail Project. We're a 15-year-old advocacy organization. We organize from the grassroots up to decarcerate Texas by organizing with and advocating for people in Texas county jails and their loved ones. There are 239 county jails in Texas and folks incarcerated in them are mostly pre-trial, so they haven't yet been convicted. And we know how important it is to ensure folks get the best care and representation before they're convicted because it can determine their whole life and interactions with the criminal justice system. So we monitor jail conditions, we advocate for folks on a case-by-case -case basis, and we also work on policy at the state level. Wow, you guys are doing some amazing work. I've heard some great things about you all. Absolutely excited for the partnership. Um, and everything that you all are doing right now, it's just amazing. But what we're here to talk about, we know that it's an election coming up and we really just want to make sure that our viewers, that our community members, our neighbors are informed. Um, so I'm gonna start out first by asking you, when I go to vote, and I walk inside, and I look at the machine, I look down, right? I see B, R, I, <laughs> what is that? Yep. So first I wanna agree with you. It is so important that folks know how critical it is that if they can vote, they do vote. Everything on the ballot has the ability to impact our everyday life. And sometimes the ballot is confusing. But we can start at those letters. Next to each person's name on the ballot, you might see that D, R, or I. And that shows what party that person is associated with. So if you see a D, that means that person is a member of the Democratic Party. If you see an R, they're a member of the Republican Party. And if there's an I, they're an independent. So they're unaffiliated with one of the two major political parties. Okay, cool. You can actually look on the ballot to see Okay, maybe I want to vote for the Democrat Party candidate. Or maybe I want to vote for the Republican Party candidate. Or you know what? Maybe I just want to go with this person who's an independent. So um, thank you for explaining that. Now that we've talked about the ballot and you know people can under have a better understanding, let's talk about the roles in the state of Texas. So um, we have some very key roles, and those key key positions play important um, aspects. What is a governor? Great question. <laughs> Seem to have a lot of power. Um, our governor in Texas is responsible for a number of things. Them and the lieutenant governor are the two most powerful people in the state of Texas. The governor essentially signs and or vetoes all bills that land on their desk from the Texas legislature. The governor is also the commander in chief of our state's armed forces. So in the same way, the president of the country is the commander in chief of the military. In Texas, our governor is the commander in chief of our state's military. The governor can also call special sessions of the legislature uh, with really wide discretion. Um, I think something that's really important for folks to know is that the governor is also able to commute sentences if folks are sentenced for a crime and they can issue pardons with recommendations from the Board of Parole and Prisons. They can also revoke pardons if it's a conditional pardon. Okay. Wow. That shows that the governor has um, an extreme amount of influence in how our, how our state operates. When you say veto, explain to us what is veto and what happens if a bill passes, it gets vetoed. What, what, what are the next steps? Sure. So a bill starts in either the House of Representatives or the Senate in the legislature and it makes its way. And if it's passed by the legislature, it goes to the governor's desk 
for signing or veto. If the governor doesn't agree with the bill and the law, they can, they can veto it. Once they veto it, there's given another opportunity to the legislature. And if two thirds of the House of Representatives and senators want to override the governor's decision, they can, and it'll still be law. If they can't have two thirds support for overriding the governor, then the veto stands and it, the bill will not be law. So we had a lot of controversial bills last year during the legislative session. We had um, Democrats that just walked out and broke quorum. So when the bill, the gun, the gun bill passed, and there were so many advocates that came out and was like asking governor, asking the governor, like, please do something, do something, do something. You mean to tell me he could have done something other than sign it? According to the state constitution, the governor can absolutely veto bills that are passed by the legislature and land on his desk. He would have been able to do so, yes, as would any governor. As would any governor. So now we're going to go to the second highest seat in the in, in Texas, and I'm going to say that if governor is the first one, then the lieutenant governor is the next one? Yes, I think different people might say the lieutenant governor is maybe the most powerful, but if you think of the hierarchy, governor, lieutenant governor, uh, but the lieutenant governor has a wide array of responsibilities and privileges when it comes to the state senate. They are the president of the state Senate, so they would be the tie-breaking vote in the event of a tie between senators. They are also responsible for forming and appointing members of the committees within the Senate. So the Senate Finance Committee, the Senate you know, Criminal Justice Committee, they choose who will be appointed to it from the senators. The lieutenant governor is also um, the governor's second Hand. So if the governorship is vacant, the lieutenant governor would assume the responsibilities of governor. So while the lieutenant governor have a lot of power and a lot of influence in the Senate, um, and we're talking about Senate, I'm going to imagine that there are people in the Senate making these decisions. Who are those people and what are they doing? Great question. Yes. Folks across the state will be voting for their state senators this November. State senators are elected officials to the state Senate and essentially they create laws and establish the state budget with the other house, the House of Representatives. There are 31 total senators in the state of Texas and they serve for four year terms. So they're up every four years. And they typically serve more people and or a wider geographic area than House of Representatives. Okay, okay, okay. Now, you said 31. When you say 31, that made me think of, I know some senators that I follow. Um, and when I look at the map, when I look at the picture of all the senators, I only see two African American senators, and I only see, um, is it maybe, I don't know, you might not, but maybe three Latin American senators. Is, we can change, people can change that with the vote, right? Certainly, I think the state of Texas has a long way to go in having diversity of its people represented and reflected back in the diversity of our representatives. And I think it is appropriate for folks to consider the diversity of the body when deciding who to vote for. For example, many journalists or newsrooms um, consider that a decision-making factor when they choose who to endorse. Oh, wow. Okay, so after the senator, we have the House of Representatives. There are also people in the House of Representatives. So tell us, who are those people? What are they doing? And are they the first ones to see a, a piece of legislation? State rep there are far more state representatives than there are senators. They typically represent smaller demo ge geographic areas than senators. 
um, and they serve two-year terms. Like senators, they also pass bills on public policy, uh, spending, raising taxes, and help with the senators in overriding governor vetoes. An example of a piece of legislation that would have to originate in the House of Representatives would be tax issues, typically okay. because they're more connected to the community and, and that they represent a smaller area. Okay, so you said just now that we have more house, more state reps than we do state senators. Is there a, is there a reason why it's like that? It follows the national model we have in our own Congress nationally. So it's called bicameral legislature. It's a really fancy word to say that there are two parts, the Senate and the House of Representatives. Um, the reason that there are fewer senators and more House of Representatives is again, like I said, the number of people they represent and how long that they serve. So the Senate is typically considered the more senior body and those members stay for a longer period of time in their term, but represent more people. So now we're going to talk about a specific, um, I know about it, um, position in, a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in Texas but a lot of people don't know that this position even exists. And that's the Attorney General's office, the State Attorney General office. What is that position all about? Why is it important and what are they doing? Very important question. The office of the Attorney General in Texas is helmed by the Attorney General, which folks will be voting for on this November's ballot. Essentially, the Attorney General is just the chief legal officer for the state of Texas. If you think about a business having a legal officer, our state does too. The Attorney General would represent the state in litigation matters, in matters related to the Constitution or the rights of Texans. They also answer legal questions for departments and agencies that make up our government. Um, so if the Department of Health and Human Services had a legal question that would go to the Attorney General. The Attorney General is also responsible for enforcing child support law um, and a wide range of other legal issues that affect uh, Texas at the state level. So Gabriella, we've been having a great conversation, very educational for our, view for our viewers. It's so beautiful outside. How about we just go outside and enjoy the beauty? Let's do it. All right, Gabriella. It is so beautiful out here. How do you feel? I feel really relaxed and really grateful to be in such a beautiful day. Me too. Me too. Um, so let's let's continue. Okay, we stopped. We talked about the Attorney General. We talked about the House of Reps. We talked about the State Senate, the Lieutenant Governor, and the Governor. We covered a lot. Yeah, done wow. good. Wow, done good. Let's talk about one of my favorite subjects. Let's talk about who oversees the Texas Health and Human Service Department. Great question. So Texas Health and Human Services is an agency in the state of Texas. And the governor has the ability to appoint the directors of those various agencies and departments. So the person that oversees Health and Human Services is its executive director, and they're appointed by the governor. They serve at the governor's discretion, so the governor can let them go, reappoint somebody, um, and maybe if the governor changes, the next governor could choose to keep the same person or appoint their own person. And and, and the Texas the, the Texas Health and Human Services Department, what do they do? What are the, what, how do they help? people they help people in a variety of ways uh, they administer a number of programs for the state they also um, have the health and human services commission which has a more expansive role in our state hospital system in mental health care for our state like our local mental health authorities um, but they assist with folks to make sure that they're living the healthiest life possible in texas ranging from an issue from disability, age, food. Wow, so snap. 
Okay, cool. I know a lot about SNAP benefits. Um, and I know every time I get a letter about SNAP benefits, it has Texas Health and Human Service Department written on there. So I always was curious to know, like, who is controlling this? So thank you for that. The next question, are you ready for a hot topic? I am ready. So right now, there is so much talk around the county judge. County judge here, county judge there, county judge everywhere. So let's talk about it. What is the role of the county judge and do they have to be an attorney? Great question. This is a super important role and there is a county judge in every county in Texas. It's a bit of a misnomer. It's a strange title for the role that they serve because they're not a judge in the sense you might think of, you know, sitting behind a bench wearing a robe. They're essentially the head of government in your county. So the head of Fort Bend County government, the head of Harris County government. Really importantly, county judges are also the head of emergency management for a county. So if there were a natural disaster, a major chemical accident in your county, your county judge is responsible for directing emergency management, making sure that uh, residents are informed of what's going on in their area. And they're also the presiding officer of a commissioner's court, which is the whole governing body of your county. So with the commissioner's court, I always wanted to know, what is a commissioner and how many do we have and how many are we supposed to have? Great question. There are typically four commissioners and one county judge in a commissioner's court. The court itself has a variety of responsibilities. So all together as a party of five, you might say, they approve the budget for your county. They also could fill vacancies in county level uh, point of offices. They also set salaries for county employees. Uh, they administer contracts for county projects and they maintain county buildings and facilities. But going smaller than that, a commissioner themselves um, is a member of the court. They represent one of the four precincts in the county. So you look up what precinct you're in and they're typically responsible for building and maintaining the county roads and bridges inside their precinct. But tell me, what is the difference between an appellate judge, a district judge, a county judge? That is a fantastic question and one a lot of people don't know the answer to. And it took me way longer than I care to admit to find out the difference between all three. I think we already covered county judge. They're not um, what we would expect when we think of a judge. So they're not sitting behind a bench in a robe and they're more an executive in the county government. Appellate and district judges, however, um, certainly have very different roles. So the district judge represents a district court. Typically, there's just one judge per, per court. And district judges and district courts are the starting jurisdiction for essentially all felony, misdemeanor, divorce, and most civil cases. So they are what you would most frequently think of when you consider a judge, and it's probably what most folks are most familiar with in the criminal legal system. It is the judge that presides over the duration of your case. Whereas an appellate judge, you can kind of hear it inside the word, oversees, reviews, and issues judgments on appeals. There are two appeals courts in Texas. There are the State Court of Appeals and the Criminal Court of Appeals. The Criminal Court of Appeals is the very last step for folks that have been convicted of a crime in Texas. And under state law, anybody that's convicted and sentenced to the death penalty, their case is automatically routed to that Criminal Court of Appeals. Similarly, the State Court of Appeals also uh, reviews and issues judgments on cases that have been appealed. Um, all appellate judges serve six year terms and typically they work together in groups of three. Okay, so on the ballot, we're gonna see all these different positions for appellate judge and we're gonna see all these different positions for a district judge. We know that the positions for the appellate judge are talking about appeals. 
That is right. And we know that appeal is basically talking about a second review. Like, let's take another look to make sure everything is on the up and up. What happens if everything is not on the up and up? What what kind of decisions can the appellate judge make? Such a great question and such an important thing to know for folks in the criminal legal system. It is a really important part of the kind of checks and balances and the rights of a defendant who's been accused of or convicted of a crime. They can take their conviction to an appellate court who can make judgments on a variety of issues or alleged issues in the way that they were convicted, such as Brady violations is one somebody might have heard of, which is uh, misconduct from the prosecutor in your case. Um, with you know failing to share evidence with the defense attorney, conflict of interest between the judge and the prosecutor. So the appellate judge um, and the appellate courts are a second opportunity for a person that maybe has con been convicted to um, seek further relief. Cool, cool. So this has been a really informative and educated um talk that we discussion that we've had um i'm sure that our viewers are going to reach out to me um reach out to bridges to empowerment and ask any questions am i able to forward those questions to you or can you tell me tell our people how do we find you later well, first, thank you again so much for inviting me. I can't tell you how important it is for people in the criminal legal system, incarcerated or otherwise, when they have the right to vote, to use it. Folks can always find us at texasjailproject.org. If you are currently incarcerated in a county jail, you can write to us at 13121 Luetta Road, number 1330, Cypress, Texas, 77429. Say it one more time. One more time. Uh, incarcerated folks can always reach us by mail at 13121 Luetta Road, number 1330, Cypress, Texas, 77429. And Texas Jail Project is overwhelmingly excited to be partnering with you on this. We're a team of just four women we're all black and latina women and we're all either formally incarcerated or have had a loved one incarcerated and i think it's so important to be working together to make sure folks inside have every opportunity they deserve and with that um thank you all for taking the time out to watch my name is coretta brown i am the executive director and founder of bridges to empowerment we have a mission here to decrease mass incarceration and to put an end to recidivism. The way that we do that is by working with organizations like Texas Jail Project and working with community to educate and bring us together so we can implement positive changes. Stay tuned for the next one. You can reach us at bridges for you on all social media platforms. You can follow me, the Hot Girl Advocate, Hot Girl Advocate, Instagram, Facebook, and TikTok. Don't forget to vote. Go vote. Go vote. Go vote.